Is the Bible relevant in an age of science? Is the universe 6,000 years old? Is evolution a fact? Has science proven the Bible wrong? In this program, research physicist and cosmologist Dr. John Gideon Hartnett will answer these questions and more. And now, we welcome you to this presentation. Is the Bible relevant in an age of science? Thanks for the opportunity to be here. My topic is, is the Bible relevant in an age of science? These days, people um, tell us science, especially Darwin, have proven the Bible wrong. I might have called this talk the damage of Darwin's legacy. Whether life, the question is whether life and everything came about by creation, creation by God, or evolution. People say, well, what does it matter, really? I heard that in Scott's church recently, they even presented a message thanking God for evolution. A few people here went down there, right? And some people say, that this is just a side issue, it's not important, it's not relevant to Christians or to the church. 2009 was called the Year of Darwin. Creation Ministries International, who I've been speaking for for many years, decades, um, made this uh, documentary to give the true commentary on Darwin's life. If you haven't seen this, I recommend uh, you have a look. Um, I've brought a few copies that we can lend around. In 2009, I visited uh, the United Kingdom. And as you do when you arrive at the airport, you usually exchange your currency. So I went over and I got some £10 notes. And as I'm walking out of the airport, I flipped it over and I just about died. I couldn't believe it. Charles Darwin has been honoured. Obviously, this was the year of Darwin. 150 years since publication of Origin of the Species and 200 years since his birth. They even put him on postage stamps and they minted a special coin. So really, you might ask this question, what did Darwin actually discover? But we are told Darwin's legacy is this evolutionary theory. And we're also told that it's compatible with the Bible. And often you hear this, they refer to it as compatible with religion. They say, don't worry, you can be a Christian and believe in evolution. God used evolution. Statements like this. And they become very commonplace. But is this true? And you know, recently in the last, say, maybe decade or so, atheists are becoming more vocal and more prolific. And it's worth listening to them at times because they become very clear in enunciating what the problem is, much clearer than, than uh, listening to churchmen. Richard Dawkins, who many of you would know, is a rabid antichrist, an anti-creationist, and he explains it like this. Many atheists in the fight to keep creationism out of schools decide it's best to say that believing in God and evolution isn't incompatible. But I'm a boat rocker. I make the case that it's difficult to believe in God if you understand evolution. Recently, there have been a number of books published also, including by Dawkins, uh, to show that Darwin or Darwinism is compatible with religion. Jerry Coyne, a professor of ecology at uh, the University of Chicago, admits that they are not, that these are science and religion are not compatible. And he makes this declaration that it's the dirty little secret in scientific circles. It is in our personal and professional interest to proclaim that science and religion are perfectly harmonious. Though he, believe, he knows, in fact, that they are not. He goes on to say, after all, we want our grants funded by the government, our school children exposed to real science instead of creationism. Liberal religious people have become important allies in our struggle against creationism. It is not pleasant to alienate them by declaring how we feel. And by science, he means to include Darwinian evolution. 
Of course, no creationists believe science and religion are incompatible, but science does not involve Darwinian theory, evolution. But he is saying creationism is not science. Okay, we'll deal with this as we in a minute. He goes on to say, this is why, as a tactical matter, groups such as the National Academy of Sciences claim that religion and science do not conflict. But their main evidence, the existence of religious scientists, and maybe you would include me in that category, is wearing thin as scientists grow ever more vociferous about their lack of faith. And that's as I said, they're becoming more and more open about this as time progresses. Now Dar Darwin year is upon us and we can expect more books, attempts to reconcile God and evolution, keep rolling off the intellectual assembly line. It never stops because the reconciliation never works. That's the real message. It doesn't work. You cannot reconcile religion, when I'm now including here the true biblical belief basis of our, the basis of our faith, the historical reading of the Bible, and you can't reconcile that with, with Darwinian evolution, but it's completely compatible with science. In all the decades of um, work I've done as a physicist, as a cosmologist, experimental physicist, as well as anything theoretical in physics, I find nothing in the Bible that conflicts with science. Uh, Creation Ministry, some of you may know, is a non-denominational organization and it's really about equipping the church with materials to answer the truth seekers, to, but to answer these questions as well. And I brought a bunch of stuff over, uh, brought a bunch of stuff with me. The left book table are basically for sale, they're new, they're from Creation Ministries. And on the right, I'm bringing these over for like the church as a, a lending library or something like that. So please um, have a look at those and, and um, take what you feel. Also, there's this website, creation.com. There's over 8,000 fully searchable articles on there, the answer to almost any of these questions that you might have. And really, this talk is about this question that um, even my mother said to me today on the phone, you know, why do, why do good things, sorry, why do bad, got to get this right way around, why do bad things happen to good people? And um, like this instant on this uh, article here about the crocodile hunter Steve Irwin when he got stabbed through the heart, you know, and, and it was in the media all over street, Australia, you know, oh, but he's such a good man, he's doing such good work for the environment and conservation and everything. Why did that happen to him? And people blame God for these things. Really, that's what this talk's about, actually. In fact, this article here that was published on uh, cre um, creation.com website is the most um, uh, downloaded article that they've ever had because it really goes to the heart of this question why these why is the world the way it is and what why do um, bad things happen in the world I would like to recommend that um, if you would like to get this uh, electronic email um, newsletter from from creation ministries that if you'd like to get it um, please sign up for it pass this around you can do that while I'm talking. It's free. You won't get spammed. All you need is a name and address, e email address I mean. Uh, fill it out and pass it around if you would like to get that. Peter Bowler is a PhD historian and author at Queen's University in Belfast, an evolutionist. And he succinctly described the problem this way. He says, if Christians accepted that humanity was the product of evolution, even assuming the process could be seen as an expression of the Creator's will, then the whole idea of original sin would have to be reinterpreted. Far from, fa far from falling from an original state of grace in the Garden of Eden, we have risen gradually from our animal origins. And if there was no sin, from which we needed salvation, what was the purpose of Christ's agony on the cross? Christ became merely the perfect man who showed us what we could all hope to become when evolution finished its upward course. Small wonder 
that many conservative Christians, and not just the American fundamentalists, argue that such a transformation has destroyed the very foundations of their faith. I mean, that's what we see. We see that as the evolution has entered the, uh, the world, it's entered the churches. The churches are embracing it and preaching it from the pulpits, and we see that the church has become very weak indeed. They have lost their faith. Because they believe this is the... Is the um, the natural order of things. They believe famine and disease and bloodshed, that this process of the survival of the fittest, the strong over the weak, that this has continued for billions of years. They believe that is the real history of this planet. Adolf Hitler applied this type of thinking in Nazi Germany. And this is a, a sign that was, is found, was, well, was found in Nazi Germany, which roughly translates that that this person is, this is what this person suffering from hereditary defects cost the German community during his lifetime, 60,000 marks. So that was the debt, the cost of the society. And Adolf Hitler's regime culled 250,000 Aryan Germans because they suffered from various defects like this, not including those six million Jews, gypsies, Polish Catholics, and so on. And the only reason was because in German there was a phrase translated here that their life was not worthy of life. That was the, the philosophy behind it. And this, is the, this philosophy is what comes from this idea, this thinking has its basis in evolutionary theory. And it says, you and I are not much more than highly evolved pond scum. And we have only come about by random chance processes over billions of years and survival of the fittest. And of course they, they draw man there at the top of that evolutionary tree. And here's quotes from two Oxford professors. Of course this is the non-Christian worldview here. Uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, Peter Atkins says, just a bit of slime on the planet. And Richard Dawkins says, we live in a universe which has no design, no purpose, no evil and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. My goodness, if you were one of those Oxford professors, why would you even bother getting out of bed in the morning? How could you honestly collect your paycheck? You see, the, the history of evolution is this record of bloodshed, survival of the fittest, the strong over the weak, and that was continuing for millions of years. Because of these evolutionary ide ideas, ultimately there is no basis for morality. They have removed those absolute standards, that absolute basis. And we see this, I shouldn't say commonplace, but these things are almost becoming commonplace. Like the Virginia Tech massacre. This is the Jacala High School massacre, where this guy, young teen, he kills himself and eight students at this high, this high school in Finland. He wrote on YouTube, before he did the deed, he said, I am our natural selector and will eliminate all who I see unfit disgraces of human race and failures of natural selection. So you can see his philosophy. He's been imbued with this philosophical mindset that comes from this evolutionary thinking. He went on to say, humanity is overrated. Life is not sacred. Humans are just a species among other animals and world does not exist only for humans. The faster human race is wiped out from this planet, the better. No one should be left alive. Wow. But this is happening time and time again. And it's happening because they have lost the standard that God has set, the moral standard. Ultimately, it depends on this question, doesn't it? Who sets the rules? If it's God, then there are absolutes. And these, these, there are rules that we need to live by. But if it is man, this is secular humanism. It's the religion of man decides truth for himself. And if man sets the rules, those goalposts are constantly changing. And you see that in these various agendas. You see that in the homosexual agenda. Slowly they move the goalposts. You, sl you see it in the abortion agenda. You see it everywhere introduce a small change. Oh, that's all we want. But the next, they want to take more and more of the pie. 
See, Christian doctrines all originate in Genesis. Pretty well every doctrine you'll find in those first 11 chapters of Genesis. Marriage, sin, death, seven-day week, clothing, the curse of the fall, why Jesus is called the last Adam, the gospel, and many, many more. And as a physicist, as a, a cosmologist, the seven-day week very much interests me because we know that one day is determined by the Earth's rotation on its axis and we know one year is determined by the, the Earth going around the Sun. But what determines a seven-day week? There's no astronomically determined period for seven days and yet cultures all over the world for millennia have used a seven-day week. You will find it in the book of Genesis because God created in seven ordinary days and rested on the seventh day. And for millennia, peoples and nations and cultures have followed the same pattern. I notice that um, you're all wearing clothing here today. And I love to say this in Singapore or places like that where it's, you know, 30 degrees outside and there's really no need for clothing. But the reason we wear clothing is we look in Genesis and we see that because of Adam's sin, God made them clothing, a covering for their shame, right? That's the origin of clothing because we live in a sin-cursed world. And of course the origin of sin, if we're preaching salvation from sin, original sin is what we inherited from our great-grandparents, Adam and Eve, the curse. And of course that curse then propagated through all the human race. Um, Jesus Christ is the kinsman redeemer. He can only redeem the sons and daughters of Adam. No one else can be saved. And that is why Jesus is called the last Adam because he fulfilled everything that Adam was meant to fulfill. He was the perfect man and he fulfilled everything. He was that perfect reflection of Adam created in the Garden of Eden. But Jesus, of course, was the Son of God and perfect and fulfilled God's will. And the gospel, the whole gospel message is there because, as you, as you all know, because of that Adam's sin and therefore all people on this planet are subject to the curse and the gospel is, as we know, to go out and to give them that message, to, to repent that they may get that life-saving grace from our Lord Jesus Christ. But what's been happening, illustrated by this wedge here, that over recent history, since Charles Darwin, this wedge of millions or billions of years here has been inserted between the creation foundation of the church or the biblical foundation and the Christian worldview. And that's what's changed. It's caused a disconnect between the Christian worldview and the, the real history, the reality that we see recorded in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And it's come about mostly through what's called modern science. And that was James Hutton in 1760 introduced this concept into geology of uniformitarianism. The idea that gradual changes in the present could be extrapolated over long periods of time. And he applied this to in, in geology and looking at formation in the earth or sedimentation and things like this. This was popularized by Charles Lyell who wrote the book Principles of Geology which Charles Darwin took on the Beagle on that boat when he sailed down into South Africa. Charles Darwin originally was a geologist, not a, not a naturalist or a biologist. The idea that the earth could be millions of years old came from Lyell and Hutton. And that gave the groundwork for Darwin's evolutionary theory that long periods of time were required. So in 1859, Charles Darwin introduced to the modern world this idea of biological evolution. Hutton took away the divine beginning of things in his deep time or long age of, of the, for the planet Earth and Charles Darwin took away the divine altogether, removing God completely from the picture. Instead of accepting science though, we must apply the Bible to the issue. If it's God's perfect and unchanging word, 
which is what I believe it is. Instead, as we often do, because we come out of that sin-cursed world, all of us are subject to the influences of that sin-cursed world. We, without knowing sometimes, we take our fallen mind and we just think the way that we have been trained or taught. But we need to make a break. We need to change that because our minds are cursed too. That type of thinking is only man's fallible opinion. Unfortunately, what happens when this type of thinking is applied, it's the Bible that gets chopped up. Instead, we should think of the Bible as God's history, history book of the universe. The creation account makes more sense than any evolutionary theory. And we need to see the, the, the Bible as a history book. You know, history comes from his story. That's God's story. I know that um, many of us, I know this is true of me, but uh, many of us bring our ideas to the Bible. And particularly with this fallen brain, we, try, we tend to apply it to the Bible and reinterpret it in order to make um, the Bible fit into science. People have reinterpreted and they brought up all these various reinterpretations. And these are just some of them. Very popular is the idea that God used evolution, theistic evolution. There was this Big Bang 13 billion years ago. God just started it off. He gave that initial bang or something or other. And then after that, God had nothing to do. The universe evolved by itself, unaided. And over billions of years, the earth formed eventually and then solidified and cooled and the oceans formed and life evolved out of the ocean by some unknown mechanism over billions of years. And they say that's how God created. Other people say something pretty close. They say all of that happened, the Big Bang, the, the age of the universe is as the scientists tell us, it's billions of years old, the earth is billions of years old, but God created progressively over billions of years and only just looks like it evolved. There's a Dr. Hugh Ross of the Reason to Believe ministry is teaching this type of thing. And many churches, like particularly the Assembly of God, the Pentecostals, are embracing that type of thinking. But it's marginally this much away from typical evolutionary thinking. And then there's the gap theory. This was very popular a um, hundred years ago and it's made a bit of a comeback where they say that there were billions of years of earth history between the first two verses of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. Nothing in there. Nothing recorded. I don't know how they can get away with that sort of thing. And um, then some say the days of Genesis, the six days when God said in the beginning, day one, he says, evening and the morning was one day, evening and the morning the second day, and so on and so on. They say those days are long periods of time, thousand years or a million years or something like that. And then the framework hypothesis simply says there's no real history at all in Genesis. It's just allegory. It's just a story to give us, teach us some kind of lessons. A lot of these ideas, of course, require then that Noah's flood just be a local event. Because you can't have a global flood four and a half thousand years ago when you're talking about all, fitting um, all the fossils as being created and died out over billions of years because a global flood would rework the whole surface of the earth and would completely muck it all up. But if you want to know where all the fossils come from, Noah's flood. The Bible spends, what, chapter upon chapter describing Noah's flood. But there's not a single mention of Lucifer's flood that the gap theorists tell us where things all went wrong. Not a single word, in fact, in the Bible. But all of these compromised positions absolutely fail in the light of Exodus 20.11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Clearly no long ages, no millions of years, no gap. There can be no gap there between God creating the heavens and the earth in verses 1 and 2 and of, of Genesis. Because the Lord did it all in six days. That's what he tells us. And God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own hand. 
in those tablets of stone. Exodus 20.11 was written by God when he revealed his perfect law to Moses on the mount. As part of the Ten Commandments, there was the Fourth Commandment, right? To keep the Sabbath. God told the children of Israel to keep the Sabbath, to work six days and rest on the seventh day. So if those days were a thousand years, that's ludicrous, isn't it? To suspect or to expect the children of Israel to work 6,000 years and rest for 1,000 years. You have to interpret the Bible consistently. And the same thing as if they were a million years, it just makes it even more ludicrous. But God himself knows what the true history of this planet is. And he told Moses, he wrote it in stone himself, these Ten Commandments. And, uh, and I think we should take note that this is the real history that he has given us. We are all subject to a world view. Everybody has a belief system. And an evolutionary world view is that they would believe the earth is millions of years old, billions of years old, that death, suffering and disease um, all are a natural part of life. They're just going on for, for, for history, for all of earth history. That monkeys uh, preceded man and this long evolutionary chain, dinosaurs eventually evolved into birds. I heard that recently on a documentary. They said, oh yeah, one said, one person, the interviewer asked what happened to the dinosaurs and this woman responded saying, they're here all around us. They simply evolved into birds. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? But we all have a worldview. I know I had this worldview. When I was 16 years old, I wrote a book with my friend in high school on cosmology. And this goes back into the 60s, the um, big theories at the time were the Big Bang Theory, but also the steady state theory. And I was a strong believer in the steady state theory because there was no beginning and there was no end to the universe. It was called the eternal universe. I now know I was running away from God. But my friend in high school became a born again believing Christian and he used to tell me, just believe in Jesus. I didn't know what he meant. I had no idea. I went on into university and I became somewhat of an enemy to Christians there because I would ask them, where did the world come from? Where did the universe come from? How did it start? What, where did man come from then, in your view? And they had no answer to these questions. Well, God in his wisdom, <coughs> God in his uh, um, wisdom, he wasn't finished with me even though I don't think anyone could have sort of gotten through to me on this sort of intellectual argument channel at the time, God brought along a woman. Because my friend in high school fell in love with a girl and she was a Baptist and pretty soon he was a Christian. But God brought along this girl who I fell in love with also. Now, she wasn't an evangelical Christian. She was actually from a Catholic family and never actually witnessed to me ever. I, I discovered why later. But God used that because God brought me to my knees. God brought me down into the pit. And I know he chose me and he smashed me until finally I would look up and I humbled myself and repented and called out, God, if you exist, please help me. And he saved me. He changed me. Very quickly, my worldview changed, but not as rapidly as you might think. Because it wasn't for one and a half more years after that experience, even though I started reading the Bible, and this is, that's another story, but some mature Christian said to me one day, have you ever read Genesis since you believed? And I said, no, never. And so I read Genesis one week and instantly God changed my whole worldview. I saw that the Bible was the, the clearest, the most logical description of the creation of the universe, much more logical than ev any evolutionary or Big Bang or steady state theory. So I became an instant creationist and I have been for the last 40 years. You see, it depends on what glasses we have on really, what we're looking through. 
And if we put on biblical glasses, we see the, the creation through the Bible, through the history in the Bible, it helps us to see the world as it really is. There is no way to absolutely detect from science what is truth. I know that might sound pretty wild, but you can't do it, and, and we'll, I'll explain as I go. Only from God's word can we determine what is absolute truth. So the Christian worldview is very different, that God created the universe about 6,000 years ago. There was no death before the fall. God created the animal kinds and plant kinds, and they adapted into their environments. They didn't stay the same. They, they were well equipped with all the genetic information to adapt to their environment. He created a, a mature creation. The dinosaurs lived at the same time as humans and Noah's flood four and a half thousand years ago reworked the entire surface of the planet laying down kilometers deep of fossils, sedimentary layers and so we find fossils all over the surface of our planet even to the top of the highest mountains. But before I go on let me tell you there are two types of science. There's operational science experimental science. I build the most precise clock in the universe, a large sapphire crystal cooled to 4 Kelvin, a few degrees above absolute zero. You think you've got a pretty good watch? No, you don't have one. I have a very good Seiko quartz here on my wrist. It cost me about $400 in Singapore. Gain or lose a second in about a month. It's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah? Come on, agree with me. In my lab, I have clocks that will gain or lose a second in around one or two hundred million years. They're the most precise clocks on the planet. But if they didn't operate from day to day the way they did the previous day, I would think there's something wrong with the laws of physics. Because, because of God's creation, because of the laws he created are stationary, we can do science. That's the only reason we can do it today. Because we can trust that they're the same. And that's what experimental science is. It's repeatable, can be tested, and it's the basis for our modern technological revolution. But historical science is something quite different. Historical science is about trying to reconstruct something that happened in the past. It's closer to forensic science. And if any of you have ever seen that television show, I know you don't watch television, but you might have by visiting someone's house, <laughs> where they go on the CSI, crime scene investigation, and they go onto the crime scene with their box of stuff and they gather fingerprints and you know, samples, paint scrapings and so on, and they go back to their lab and they do experimental science in the lab on those samples. And the next thing they do is they construct a story about how they think the crime went down. That is not experimental science. That's historical science, a forensic science. It's very weak because you're trying to construct something that happened in the unobservable past. And that's why it's so weak. You see, the evidence is all the same. All we have is this evidence that we gather in the present and then we have to try and construct a history of what happened in the past. You think about the problem then, what about the earth, the age of the earth? They say it's four and a half billion years old and all this evolution happened and sediments and all this happened. How can they determine that? There's no eyewitness to past events. There's no experiment that can move back in time and make a, a test or make an observation in the past. Time machines are impossible. You see, that's why it's so weak. It's really history anyway. And to answer a history question, you need a history book. There's only one reliable history book that we have, and that's the Word of God. There is no other, because only God was there in the past. He's the only observer at the creation of the universe, at the creation of this planet. There were no other observers. At your birth... There was a doctor and a nurse, maybe, unless you were born in a hut in the bush. And that's the only reason we know how old Forbes is. Well, he knows. I don't know. Because someone wrote it down. Someone was an eyewitness to the event. 
But historical science is very weak. And historical sciences have been applied to these things, to fossils. People associate fossils, particularly these fish fossils, there are millions of them found, but they associate that with millions and billions of years of Earth history. Now a fossil is when formed, when the animal dies or is buried and leaves an impression in the rock. It's turned into stone. Fish fossils, as I said, are the most common. 95% of all fossils are marine fossils. So how quickly did this fossil form? Can you see what's in its mouth? So this one was buried at least while it was eating its lunch. See, fossils must form rapidly, not slowly. They tell us in the, the school books, this is from, uh, from the ACT, the Biological Science book, they say that the fish over millions of years, well this is maybe th hundreds of thousands of years, there's this mountains here and the fish is swimming and then eventually it dies. The mountains are eroded down, the sediments come into the, o into the lake or the sea and s cover over the fish. And over hundreds of thousands of years those sediments pack down and turn into uh, like s rock fossilizing the fish. So hundreds of thousands to millions of years processes they're talking about. But you know actually that that's completely a myth. It's a lie. You don't see that happening anywhere. Have you ever seen a nature documentary with fish lying on the bottom of the ocean waiting to be covered over by sediments and formed into fish fossils? Never. It's a myth. It's a lie. It doesn't happen. Experimental science tells you it's not possible. I'll tell you how fish fossils form. Well, my daughter Catherine used to keep goldfish. She had tanks of goldfish. She was always trying to keep these fish alive. So as an experimental scientist, I went over to the chemistry lab and I got some cyanide and I took it home one day and I wanted to see how you get a fish fossil. So I poured some into one of her goldfish tanks <laughs> and I discovered that fish don't even sink to the bottom. That's experimental science. Oh, you're thinking, what sort of father is he? <laughs> I didn't have to do that, actually. Her fish kept dying natural causes constantly. <laughs> you see, like I said, you, you don't see this process happening today. It's a lie. It's a myth. So how do you get a fish fossil? Well, here's Freddie Fish swimming along, minding his own business. And under the ocean, even today, we see what are known as rapid turbidity currents, underwater avalanches and so on. Freddie gets rapidly covered and buried. Oxygen is quickly excluded. And even the natural breakdown processes are retarded, like bacterial breakdown and so on. And we see the silica in the minerals exchange with the the calcium and carbon in the body and you get a Freddy fish fossil. I'll tell you that quickly. You see, fossils do not tell us so much about how something lived but how it was buried. Here in Tasmania at Fossil Bluff we find two types of fossils are all jumbled up in this cliff face. We find possums and whales, many of them in confusion, all jumbled up. Now I don't know if anyone's a biologist here, except for Longiza here, but who knows where foss uh, possums live? Trees, right? Anyone dispute that argument? Trees. But where do whales live? Now that's a tough one for you. They don't live together in the same environment, do they? See, it doesn't tell us about how they lived, but how they died. And what better explanation of how that happened than Noah's flood, a global flood that covered the earth with tidal waves as high as 200 metres sweeping around the planet with a, the mid-Atlantic ridge opening up 10,000 miles long volcanic eruptions. A total catastrophic disaster all over the earth for about a year. Do you think that would have left an impression on the planet? Absolutely it did. That's what happened. You find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the planet. And yet they tell us there was no global flood. 
They even tell us sometimes it was just a local flood in Mesopotamia. But we see the evidence everywhere. And uh, I went to Grand Canyon a few years ago and took some beautiful pictures. And I find this very fascinating. This is here the Hermite Shale and the Coconino Sandstone. The evolutionists tell us that there's tens of millions of years of evolution between these two layers of rock. That meant that the Hermite Shale just sat there bare, uncovered for tens of millions of years and then later the Coconino Sandstone was laid down on top of it. But I don't see any erosion. This is a knife edge between these two layers. See, the stories don't add up. They're just just so stories to explain their evolutionary thinking. And if we look carefully into the Coconino sandstone, you see what's called cross hatching. This is the best photo I could take of, I found of it. You see all these cross hatch lines. So if you can imagine during Noah's flood, you had sand dunes forming under the ocean, and then the, another quick wave or current flew, flowed through, ripping off the tops of the sand dunes, leaving sort of cross hatched. Uh, dunes there and then sediments packed down on top of that. That's the only way you can explain such large columns of cross-hatched uh, sediments, not by slow, gradual deposition, millimetre per year over millions of years. Makes no sense at all. But a global flood certainly makes a lot of sense. And this ichthyosaur here, a mother ichthyosaur, you know how we know it's a mother ichthyosaur, because she was caught fossilized while she was giving birth. Now a million years to give birth, I think that's the limit. I would call that extremely hard labor, wouldn't you ladies? You see, these things happen very rapidly indeed. Fossilization is a rare event, but happens rapidly. And this is another example this is a, a ring, a fossil ring here that was found up in the northwest cape of Western Australia by some, some people who sent it down to the uh, creation uh, research scientists in uh, Brisbane. And this ring was found, and they found it very peculiar because you held it up and hit it with a hammer, it would ring like a bell. So they smashed it open and inside they found in here uh, very small crustacean fossils, micro fossils. And as the story goes, this, this, um, um, the gentleman who found this uh, also told them that the new in 1920s to 1970s, there were fencing contractors that had gone up around the northwest and they were fencing in all the, the sheep stations up there. And some of the contractors would roll up the wire that they didn't use and throw it in the ocean. Not environmentally the right thing to do, but they did that. So within 50 years, you had fossilized number eight fencing wire. Certainly not 65 million years ago, someone herding or, or farming dinosaurs, you know. Rapid fossilization occurs all the time. There are many examples of this sort of thing. And uh, Creation Magazine, which I brought a whole bunch over there. I brought a lot from home, so you're free to, the ones on the right table there, you're free to just take one of those. They're, they're my old ones. Have a look, have a look at it. Also, if you would like to sign up for it, I have some of these sign-up sheets, so I'm going to leave on this table here. This is a very good uh, magazine. There's no advertising in it, and it gives you a lot of information to fight the good fight. And um, this article here, oh, this is, came from Creation Magazine. This is uh, um, the discovery of red blood cells in dinosaur bone. This is dinosaur, that the, the original one was taken from a museum and uh, the scientist is Mary Schweitzer. She sliced it open and under the microscope discovered what looked like red blood cells. But you see the problem is this, dinosaurs are supposed to have died out 65 million years ago and red blood cells could not survive more than 10,000 years. Even, even this is evolutionist telling us this. When she looked at this, she said it was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone, but of course I couldn't believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones after all are 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? You see, she was shocked because of her worldview. 
She had an evolutionary worldview. And that's why it's shocking to her. But if you put on, everyone has this worldview, as I've explained, right? You all have a worldview. Put on your creation glasses, your biblical glasses, and you look at this and you see it's easy. The, the flood was only four and a half thousand years ago. It doesn't take so much of an effort to understand this. 2005, she published more evidence. She took uh, bones from museums again and she dissolved away some of the bony matrix in, in a solution that left behind soft connective tissue, blood vessels, red blood cells, and even recently I heard they're even now starting to isolate DNA. So how could these things be tens or, 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 or 60 or odd million years old? Now the evolutionists are starting to try to work out how this type of material can survive 65 million years. So with their worldview, they believe absolutely this stuff is 65 million years old, but now they have to figure out how that works with the science. See, they turn it around, but it makes much more sense. And she said at the time, as the fossil dissolved, transparent vessels were left behind. It was totally shocking. Schweitzer says, I didn't believe it until we had done it 17 times. So the 17 times is the experimental science, right? The repeatable science. But the shock again, it's because of the worldview. So when a paleontologist digs up a bone, does he dig it up with a label on it saying it's 65 million years old? No, he doesn't, right? He digs into those rock layers and he finds his fossil. And if he doesn't know how old the rock layers are, he gets on the phone to his friend, the geologist, and he says, how old are these sedimentary layers that I found my fossil in? And the geologist tells him the age of the sediment so he can date the age of his fossil or get the age of his fossil. But how does the geologist date the, the sediments? He dates them by calling up his paleontologist friend and saying, I found, I got these rock layers here. How old are they? And the paleontologist says, what fossils did you find in them? And he dates the rock layers by the fossils that are found in them. It's totally circular. This is what I'm trying to explain. There is no way to date anything in the past. So the age is just an interpretation and it's based on this worldview, this whole structure of evolutionary theory that they then fit everything into. It doesn't have any basis in what we call, would call experimental science in the lab. Sure they do experimental science, but it, the interpretation is applied through their worldview. Some Christians tell us, as I said, that evolution is a fact, or God used it, or progressive creation, God created over billions of years. The Bible tells us when God created the Garden of Eden, at the end of that process, everything was very good, was perfect, right? But if the theistic evolutionists are correct, and, and God created the Garden of Eden, uh, Hugh Ross says 40,000 years ago, after billions of years of death and suffering and disease, and that's what we find in the uh, sedimentary layers, then how could God have said at the end of creating the garden that it was very good? It makes no sense at all. But we know the Bible's true. The Bible is God's word. Turn this thing around and therefore we know that all of these sediments with all of these uh, fossils in them are result after the fall. So they're very young indeed, all the sediments. In fact, of course, Noah's flood is the, is the best um, mechanism to fo form these things rapidly through rapid processes. And we do find modern day diseases in the, in the fossil record. So this is after the curse, after God, after God has cursed the planet and the whole universe, in fact. The Bible tells us in Romans 5.12 that literal sin means literal death. Whereas by one man sin entered the world and, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men because of all have sinned. But thank God for his redeeming power, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus 
has made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Amen. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for this fact. But evolution says this process of death was natural to the world, was natural to the planet for billions of years. And through this process of death and survival of the fittest, man eventually evolved. The Bible tells the opposite story. Through man's action, Adam and Eve, through their decision, death entered the world. And now it's a sin-cursed world. And that's why bad things happen to good people. Well, there are no good people, are there? See, the Christian worldview is different. It's this story of the creation, the perfect creation that was marred by this, the curse, the corruption, and then the, the global flood of Noah, the catastrophe, the confusion that came at, at the Tower of Babel when God dispersed all the language groups and those language groups carried a knowledge of him to all parts of the earth. And that's even very fascinating about the Chinese characters, which I don't have time for. And then Christ came as prophesied and paid the price to redeem his children on the cross. And we're waiting for the ultimate consummation and eventually the restoration of all things that is predicted in the Bible. You see, the Garden of Eden before the fall, it was a life of ease. Just pick it off the fruit off the tree. No labor. After the fall, toil, hard work, labor in the ground, um, hard labor for the women in childbirth and so on. It's a different world. It's a sin-cursed world. And sometimes you see those documentaries, David Attenborough, he's whispering away, he's on the plains of Afri Africa and he's saying, just wait and you watch this, you see the gazelles and a lion leaps out and brings down the gazelle and he says, isn't it wonderful? It's a natural part of life. It's not. It's not part of God's original creation. It's marred. But of course, God has provided the answer in, in his son. So this is really um, could have been called uh, why is there death and suffering in the world? Probably the number one asked question of Christians on this planet. Because the, the world was once perfect and uh, through Christ and through the promised restoration of all things we'll see God bring back that perfect creation again. Christ being the second Adam is going to restore all things. And we'll see eventually the new heaven and the new earth. Revelations 21, it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So the curse is real. You know, the curse can't be part of some allegory or some just moral story. It must have been a real thing because God's going to take it away. It's going to take away death. It's going to be eliminated. So it's real history. You see the balance. It's God is bringing it back. But he cast Adam and Eve out of the garden so they wouldn't eat of the, of the tree of life because they had sinned against him. And Revelations tells us in the midst of New Jerusalem was the tree of life and there's no more curse. So the tree is real. The tree of life is real. That's real history in the garden and it's going to be real to us again in the heavenly city when we get to eat of the fruit of the tree of life with all of us together. It's going to be fun. You see, <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be more than that. This is the real underlying problem and sometimes... We, oh, well, not sometimes, we hear in this world it's getting pretty bad. In fact, in, only in the last, my lifetime, I see how bad even Australia has become in moral standards. Nowadays, we see family breakups. I think the divorce rate is well over, a bit over 50% now, something like that. We see abortion, homosexual behaviour, what well, they're going for gay marriage now. What's this, full-term abortion or something in Tasmania, is that right? And um, pornography, euthanasia, that's almost become legalised and much more. And you know these things though, they're symptoms of the problem, they're not the real problem. 
they're, they're symptoms of this underlying problem with the culture. And this castle diagram really describes it. The problem number one, Psalm 11.3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And the foundations are really the foundations of the church. The church is built on the creation foundation. God's word. That you can take it as the absolute authoritative source of knowledge. The word of God. You can trust it. That was what caused the reformation. That they depended and trusted the word of God. But often this is what's happening in the church today. Yeah, some people are fighting against these issues and that's right. But they're shooting all over the place because the foundation of the church is being destroyed. The creation foundation, this evolution poison is entering in and destroying the church. A friend of mine who came from Indonesia one time told me this story of the Batak people in Indonesia. The Batak are a tribe, they're a fiercely Christian for over 400 years. And they live next to the Achenese, we're right on the tip of Sumatra, and they're fiercely Islamic. The Islamics could never make a convert of the Bataks because they were so strong for the Lord. They resisted all efforts of the Islamic missionaries. Until about 20 years ago, the Indonesian government introduced teaching evolution into the schools in Indonesia. And the Batak children, of course, also learnt evolution. And for the first time now, we see Batak people, because they gave up their religion or their faith in God, the, the Islamic missionaries are making progress in converting Bataks into is, to Islam. So you see this process, and in our society we see it in schools, we see it everywhere. The church is embracing it. Churchmen heralding Darwin, heralding even people like Richard Dawkins as great men and great thinkers. This is the problem in our society. The solution, Isaiah 58, 12, And they that shall be of me shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. So we need to build up that creation foundation. We need to focus solidly on the word, to understand the word, but we do need to learn a bit of science too. This is a scientific age. And that's why I brought these books along. Please have a look at them. You can buy the ones on the left table. You can take the ones on the right table. Have a look. Maybe they can become a library for this church. But we need to arm the church. We need to be prepared so that we are better witnesses and so that we can um, help those who need help in this area. So we are effective um, weapons against the humanist onslaught. And that's what's happening. If I was an evolutionist, I would be shocked to see something like this. Because they don't believe, of course, that man and dinosaurs live together. So therefore, they would not expect any evidence of native tribes or something like that with um, drawings of dinosaurs. You probably never hear about that in the media. Well, we do see that, in fact. This is a picture here from, uh, from the US, and it's outlined down here just for the same thing, but it's hard to see in this picture, that could be nothing else other than some kind of a, um, a sauropod dinosaur. And American native Indians are those who drew this picture. And there's another one here that's much easier to see. It's been outlined there now and it's fading, but you can still see it in the original rock art. This is in Utah. This is protected. as They keep it in a secret location so that people don't destroy this. But this shows in modern times, natives of America who have lived with animals that are like what we would call dinosaurs. And in Cambodia, there's... Um, a temple that was carved hey, in the jungles of Cambodia and this carving is known to be at least a thousand years old and it's known because of what's called patina it's like a growth of bacteria that an algae that grows up in the surface of the rock as as it accumulates sediments over time and 
what do you think this looks like? Like a stegosaurus, right? Something very similar. That people, humans in our modern time or modern era, certainly within the last few thousand years, have lived with what we would call dinosaurs. In fact, the Irish story records uh, in, in 900 AD records a large beast with iron tail, irons on, nails on its tail that pointed backwards. Its head was shaped a bit like a horse's and it had thick legs with strong claws. So that's, there are many, many accounts of this in literature and I think there might even be a book over there called The Great Dinosaur Mystery that records a lot of these. So I think um, this means that Adam and Eve had some cool friends in the Garden of Eden. They lived together. God created a perfect paradise, a perfect world, and they lived together before the curse, before these things or any of these things became meat eaters. And 1 Peter 3.15 tells us to sanctify the Lord God in our heart, number one, but be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you or the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So I think this is important for us to equip and arm ourselves with this material that we may answer those who are seeking the truth and of course that we may um, stand strong in this uh, so-called age of science. There are many books over there, I, I'm not going to go through them, but uh, I, I like this small track. There's a number of tracks that can be used for witnessing small books. I take them out with me. I think they're very powerful. There's a number there called, um, one called here, the 15 reasons to take Genesis as real history. And this is the history that Jesus Christ himself took. 37 times Jesus spoke of Genesis. And he spoke of it in a very matter-of-fact way as a real history. And yet the churchmen today tell us that that's just all allegory, even though they, they supposedly be, believe in Jesus Christ. They don't believe in the Jesus that spoke of Genesis as real history. Okay, so we're going to have questions open to the floor. Anyone would like to ask a question? Okay, the greatest evidence. Evidence, only, evidence can only support a worldview, right? So all evidence that's discovered is evidence. The evolutionist has the same evidence that I have, I have. When I've looked at the cosmos, though, I've found in the cosmos the evidence does not support the Big Bang we call it their evolutionary model. Because in the cosmos, they have had to make up fudge factors to make their theory fit the observations. And when I say this, this is quite serious because in the standard Big Bang model today, they require that the universe be made up of 72% dark energy and 24% dark matter. That means the stuff in this room the stuff that you're sitting on, that you're made of, is normal matter. And there's all this other crazy matter that can't be detected in this room that makes up 85% of this room. But when I look at the cosmos, I don't see that. I look at the cosmos as the creation of God. Um, I recorded a video called Hubble Bubble Big Bang and Trouble. I recommend you have a look at it. In that, I suggest that the evidence we see in the cosmos of the creation of stars and galaxies is looking back into day four of creation week. You see, I can't prove that, but I say that supports a creation by God, a creator God. Because the alternative is so flawed. They have to make up all sorts of uh, fudge factors. Well, there's, I think there's two parts to this question. One part is, what about radiocarbon? What about carbon-14? The other part is, what about all the other dating methods that they use to establish long ages for the Earth, the sediments, right? So can I very quickly cover these two um, questions? 
And to do so, I want to show you some slides first, because by showing you this, it helps with the second part. So the first part is what about carbon-14? By the way, I always get asked that question every time I speak. So I had to prepare this. Was it, I prepared it ahead of time. So this is true of any radioactive dating method, but carbon-14 is a, like a clock. For the non-scientific here, the way this works is cosmic rays bombard the, bombard the upper atmosphere, converting nitrogen molecules into carbon-14 molecules. Plants and animals absorb that carbon. It's just normal carbon to them, and it is exchanged with the atmosphere during their life, and when they die, the carbon-14 starts to decay. It becomes, we, we call it a clock, because it decays away. And we find it everywhere, and so it can be used to date the age of something that was living that is now dead, that has carbon in it, essentially. And over a period of time, if you look at the living animal, you have a certain amount of carbon-14, and at the moment of death, it's the same because it's no longer exchanging it with the atmosphere. The amount of carbon-14 decays away, even though the total amount of carbon remains the same. And then after a period of time, there will be no carbon-14 left in, in that fossil or that, that dead animal or that charcoal or something, right? Some dead carbon-bearing material. And what's interesting is this, is that no carbon-bearing mineral on Earth has ever been found that contains no carbon-14. None. Doesn't exist. And yet even the evolutionists say that after 250,000 years, there should be no carbon-14 left. So if all those fossils are older than 250,000 years, they should contain no carbon-14. But guess what? They do. They all do. You get the problem? And so with modern dating techniques, we can date a, a, a specimen out to 90,000 years old. The modern techniques are precise enough to do this. So, uh, um, you see, the evolutionist tells us that coal formed in ancient swamps millions of years ago. The swamps died and got buried and over time they got packed down and formed into coal today, right? And so the coal should be somewhere between 40 and 400 million years old. So some crazy creationists decided to go to the coal bank in America and just like you have money banks, they have coal banks there. America has everything. And they took some withdrawals of coal from different samples around America and they decided to carbon date the coal. No evolutionist would ever think of doing this because he believes that it's too old to have any carbon-14 in it. You understand this? It would have all decayed away. But the crazy creationists have a different worldview and they wanted to see if you could carbon date coal. So they took samples, they used an intermediate company, so the testing laboratory didn't know it was from a crazy creationist, the Institute of Creation Research it was, and they sent it to these laboratories and they used the advanced mass accelerator techniques and the three independent reports came back with dates for the coal as being somewhere between around less than 50,000 years old for coal that was between assumed age, evolutionary age, 30 to 300 million years old. So they carbon dated it to 50,000 years. Now that's not exactly the same as the biblical timeline of 6,000 years, but they used evolutionary assumptions. You see, to date, even to make a carbon-14 date, you have to assume the original carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio back when the animal died is the same as it is today. But it's not. It's changing. Not only that, there was Noah's flood that buried the entire biosphere, was buried under sediments. Everything's fossilised, remember? All the coal. They were forests growing before the flood that got all buried in Noah's flood changed the carbon-12 content of the biosphere. 
Making those assumptions, making what I call creationist assumptions, it converts that number, 50,000 years, into four and a half thousand years. Isn't that amazing? Using proper experimental science and a proper application of historical science, we reproduce Noah's flood. One more thing that they did, actually I like this verse here, speak to the earth and it will teach thee. See, it's the earth, right? See, it's teaching us something from the earth. These crazy um, creationists also thought, well, diamonds are made of carbon. Why don't we date some diamonds? And they bought some diamonds. And ladies, do you know what they do when they carbon date diamonds? They crush them up. They crush them up. Not only that, they vaporize them, turn them into carbon dioxide. So those diamonds are gone forever. But believe me, <laughs> believe me, I've got to say it, diamonds are a creationist's best friend. <laughs> because diamonds are supposed to come well, they do come from what are called pipes, diamond pipes. And these pipes are supposed to form over, yeah, the order of billion year time scales, half a billion to a billion years. So the diamonds are meant to be a billion years old. But they carbon dated them and they got dates of actually of order of thousands of years, around about 50,000 years. Some fairly large error bars, that's why they've just written thousands of years here. But there's no way you can get carbon-14 into a diamond because it's the most dense matrix, dense crystal you can have. No one knows how you could artificially in introduce it. Just simply means the diamonds aren't that old. They testify to a young earth, to a creation um, consistent with the Bible. And then, second part of the question, is then what about all those other dating techniques? Not carbon-14, but um, like um, uranium lead, potassium argon, and so on, that give long ages that they, we hear. We see they use uh, dating processes that have long half-lives. Carbon-14 has a short half-life, 5,730 years. They use uranium that has a half-life of like a billion years takes a long time for the products to decay away. The problem is, how do you know what was in the sample or in the rock when it, it, when it was first encapsulated? You know, it's got to be a closed system. You can't say that the minerals that God originally created on the earth didn't contain a mixture of, say, potassium argon or, or um, uranium and lead. You know, they make the assumption there was no lead there in the beginning, which is just a crazy assumption because they cannot possibly know. And it's only because of those assumptions do they get long ages. However, having said that, using those methods, the longer age dating methods, they have dated, for example, the Mulawea volcano in Hawaii that erupted 200 years ago and they dated the basalt that came from the volcanic eruption and they got dates of like 30, to, uh, 30 million to 3 billion years from an eruption that we know only happened 200 years ago. What it simply means is that in the lava that's coming to the surface it already has both the potassium and the argon in it. They've even dated basalts from all over the earth that it's coming from the same layer in the crust or under the crust and they get different dates. So the assumption that these uh, clocks, as you call them, can date, reliably date the earth is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. And it completely throws in all of this into disarray, this date, these so-called dating techniques. All right, so before the curse, there were no meat eaters, right? There were no meat eaters. Because the Bible clearly says there's no death before sin. So you have a real problem if you've got death before sin. And uh, this is the problem that Hugh Ross and these people face. Theologically, they're on, well, they're not on any ground at all. But God's creation 
um, is, was well designed for all conditions. So in a, in a post-cursed, in a cursed world, there's design also. Now, how the curse occurred and what happened at the curse and whether um, white pointers suddenly got sharp teeth, that's another question. And I don't think there's a single answer. And nor do the creationist movements who have looked at this sort of question believe there's a single answer to that question. For example, there's a mosquito that only sucks juice out of plants. And yet people would tell us that the mosquito, the female, has to derive its nourishment out of, you know, living organisms, the blood out of a living organism. That's not true, actually. There are some that don't. So what might have happened, for example, in that scenario, in the, in the post, in the cursed world, their food source dried up and they were able to adapt to a new environment. So maybe in that case there was no new structure, they just used it in a different way. Um, in the case of um, wasps that sting, again, it may have been a different mechanism. But now you talk about carnivores and carnivores that are somehow needed to maintain sort of a balance in nature. That's really the question, isn't it? Yeah. So God is sovereign. God has a design. And even though the world was cursed, God had a plan. And some of it may have been new genetic information introduced at the curse in order to establish that type of um, habitat that can be stable, right? So that you get white pointers going around cleaning up all the dead whales in the ocean, for example, you know, because death was introduced, whereas there was no death before that. Survival of the fittest. Now, that, this, this is another whole... It's a bad term to use. I used it in reference to evolution. Survival of the fittest is actually a bad concept because... Um, by definition in the evolutionary thinking, survival of the fittest is the fittest is determined by that which survives. It's, it's, a, it's a circular argument, you know. So in the world, obviously animals need survival instincts. I believe those are inbuilt by God. And same with the genetic adaptation that, that has um, come about is part of the inbuilt design plan by God. So he put the genetic code in them um, as necessary to survive in the new world, in the new habitat. Um, uh, can I just show you a little bit of genetics? We know all species are highly diversified, right? All humans are the same, right? There's only one blood, one race of man. All humans are the same. All our, we all have the same skin colour, right? And I'm not white because that paper over there is white. We all have melanin in our skin. God inbuilt genetic diversity into the original genome. And it covers what you're saying, but maybe in terms of how the mechanism might work, which I'm not covering, but this is a general principle that it was planned from creation. Variations with, within kinds and the ability to adapt within the environment. So evolutionists often argue, a straw man argument say that creationists say that the world that we see today is as God originally created it. That is not the case at all. It was the perfect world that I described that got marred by sin and cursed and it is a very broken world today. But God gave all animal and plant species enough genetic information to survive in the new world under all different types of environments. Because we see life even in the rocks down to 100 kilometres deep in the earth, we see life in the atmosphere as high as 50 kilometres in the atmosphere we see life in the Antarctic, we see it in the deserts, we see it everywhere, and life does genetically adapt. That information did not come from evolution. Never use the word microevolution either, ever, in an argument, because it's false. 
God created genetic diversity, information in the genome, microevolution implies change, therefore the evolutionist says just extrapolate that for a long enough period of time and you have evolutionary change. But it doesn't work like that because it works like this. You have Mr. and Mrs. Dog here and they have two genes. This is, of course, an illustration. They have many genes, but they have one for short hair and one for long hair. And so they both are medium-haired dogs. And they get married and they have children. And of course, the possibility is that one short-haired gene can come from each of mum and dad and you get a very short-haired dog. Also, you have a 50% probability just by random chance or shuffling of the genes of getting two medium-haired dogs. And then, of course, you can get the other guy who's got both of the long-haired genes. There's 25% chance of getting that. And my wife and I know from nine children that we definitely pass our genes on to our children. Neither of us had red hair, but three of our nine children had red hair. There's also recessive genes. And recessive genes can come together and get expressed in the children. As this guy here, he's really probably the black sheep of the family, right? But this family then all decide to move to the North Pole and live up in the North Pole because there was another family of this type of dog breeding up there and of course they got together and up in the North Pole the trouble is it's too cold and these guys die out. They don't have enough hair to keep them warm and they die and then these guys, the ones that were left, get married and have children and they only have long-haired dogs because the information is lost. You see, the, the information to for short hair is lost and this is totally true even though this is a very simplistic explanation but evolution needs an increase of information and evolution doesn't have it it's always lost all the time and same goes for humans we have humans that have uh, we can we categorize it here by four genes for skin color big A little a big B little b and you can imagine if you have mulattoes, medium colour skin, and they get together and they have kids, and you can see right there, well, actually you can get up to nine different skin tones from mixing those, those genes, right? And this is typified by this, this, these twins. They were born to a pair of Jamaican couple and in the UK, and one is white and one is dark. Are they identical twins? Oh, you're smart. Some people are smart. Some people get that right away. Some people have to think about that for a minute. No, she's not albino. No, she is not. She just has the genes for light colored skin. Yeah, they're not identical, but of course they're, they're twins. And here they are, well, a little bit older. And they're the parents. And so from that, you see, they get that skin color. And here they are now in their teens. See. We are all the same blood. We share the same genetic code. And this, this is, we know this because, you know, you can give blood to anyone on the planet if you're of the right blood type, of course. And there are many stories in the war where, you know, someone who's from different race has shared his blood with a dying soldier, and, you know, because that was the, be the best they could do at the time. And there's many stories like that. But you see, the information in the genome describes loss of information over time. Breeding dogs describes a loss of information. Like a Chihuahua have about 250 known genetic conditions. If you ever buy a Chihuahua, you, are, you need to have a bank, a bank, own a bank, you know. They are a genetic problem waiting to happen. That's all they are. I think, um, I think it's the German Shepherd actually has a problem with its hip. It's a genetic defect with its hip. There are many known defects in the so-called pure breeds of dogs. The best dog you ever want to have is a mutt because they have it all mixed up. They have their strong. Even though there's many defect genes now and the defect genes occur by random chance. Shuffling by random chance. That's all. By no other means. 
We are now 6,000 years since the creation and there's been a lot of opportunity to shuffle up the genes and cause a lot of defects. And that's why you should not marry your sister or a close relative because you get those genes together and you can have deformed babies.